people were not here, we're going to revisit it. Um, we're going to the second book in the Bible, Exodus chapter 2, it will also be displayed on the screen. If you have one of the Bibles from the church, it will be on page 43, I believe. Exodus chapter 2, we read the first 10 verses from the New God Standard Version, and it reads as follows. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket and plastered it with bitumen and pitch, and she put the child in it and placed him in the reeds on the bark of the river, bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendant walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. When his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Can we say thanks be to God? Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to spend a few moments talking about difficult decisions within motherhood, difficult decisions. Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, with all your grace and your mercy and your kindness, we in this moment ask that you speak to us beyond all of the things that may be going through our minds and our hearts, whatever we may be feeling or experiencing in this moment, God, that you will permeate those thoughts and those feelings and touch us exactly in the place where we are able to open our ears and our hearts to you. May we receive a word from you. May we hear it. May we be changed and transformed. And may it set us on a path or continue us on a journey that we're already on towards being more obedient to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Difficult decisions or lessons within motherhood. So everyone sitting in this room is connected to a family that has a history that if we are able to look back within that history, provides some form of lessons if we really pay attention. The children of Israel are no different. They have this very drama-filled history. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to go and read all the details. But in order to get the proper context for our passage today, I feel like we need to at least revisit a bit of that history so that we can get caught up. Amen? So Abraham was called by God to be the father of nations. He was the father of the Israelite children that were the chosen people. And he married a woman named Sarah. He had two children. One, his oldest son was Ishmael, born by Hagar, the handmaiden of his wife, which was a custom of the day. But through strange circumstances, he had this child. We can go back and read that at another time. His second son, Isaac, born of Sarah in her old age, was the one who would carry on this blessing and this legacy. Now, Isaac married a woman named Rebecca, and he and Rebecca had twin sons, Esau and Jacob. Now, again, some very interesting events led to Jacob and his mother, Rebecca, tricking Esau into handing over his birthright and to receiving the blessing that Isaac would give normally to his eldest son. So then the lineage was passed down through Jacob. Jacob met a woman and fell in love with her by a will by the name of Rachel. And her father said, you have to wait seven years to marry her, only for seven years to come and for him to be tricked into marrying Rachel's older sister, Leah. And he had to wait an additional seven years in order to marry the love of his life, Rachel. So now he's married to two sisters, and between those two sisters and two other handmaidens, he has a number of daughters, but he has 12 sons. And the lineage of these 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. 
Now, Jacob loved one son more than the others, and that was Joseph. And of course, Joseph was a bit arrogant about this, and his brothers didn't really like the favoritism, and so they did some very extreme things. And so what they did was they decided to sell Joseph in slavery. <laughs> they come back and they tell his daddy that he was attacked by a wild beast, and they even bring his robe that they have dipped in blood to his father. So his father is grieving a son that has not died, but that has been sold into slavery by his other sons. He ends up a slave in Egypt, but through a series of blessings by God, rises to second in command over the entire country. A famine happens back home, and Joseph's brothers have to travel to Egypt in desperation and in need, where they re-encounter their brother. And through a series of different conversations and visits and healings that requires a lot of forgiveness, all of Joseph's family comes to Egypt to be reunited and they can receive for their needs. So this is how the children of Israel end up in Egypt. They spend time there, they grow and they multiply. Eventually Joseph and Jacob and all of his brothers die and they continue to grow and multiply. But then a new Pharaoh comes into command and he sees all these foreign people living in this country and he becomes threatened. He says, if I don't stop these people from multiplying and growing, they're going to overtake some stuff and it will be bad for us. And so what he does is he tells them, he first he enslaves them, so that's how they become slaves, and then he tells them, their midwives, he says, all of the male Israelite children are to be killed. Only the girls can lead them. Now we pause here because we've seen this happen in other points of scripture, right? Jesus, with King Herod, he demands that all of the male babies under two, year old, two years old be killed. But we see this even seeping into the culture of the day as so many black and brown men are often targeted and you know, the whole decimation of a, of a nation is often comes through the killing of male babies. This is not a new kind of concept. It's been happening for a very long time. Well, the midwives, who are Israelites, fear God more than they fear the Pharaoh, and they decide that they're going to let these male babies live. So at the time that Moses' mom, Yacob, um, Yacobed, gets pregnant, this is how Moses is able to live. Pharaoh finds out that the midwives are letting these babies live, and so he tells all of his other subjects, he says, if you see an Israelite male baby, I want you to take that baby and I want you to put that baby in the Nile so that it drowns and it dies. So Moses' mom is looking at her baby boy, and she's looked into his eyes, and she knows that he's special. She sees something on him. Our text says that he's a fine baby, but if you read other translations, they will say that he's special, that he has a special call on his life. She hides him for three months, but she knows it's only a matter of time before somebody's going to see him and is going to take him from her and thrust him into the Nile. She is faced with a very difficult decision. I can't imagine as a mother what it would be like to hold my child for three months and to know that I'm facing the decision of whether or not I do something different or whether or not I just wait for somebody to come and kill him. So she says, okay, I, I gotta do something different. And so what she decides to do is she decides to take a risk. She makes a very risky decision. She takes a, a basket and she covers it with bitumen and with pitch, which waterproofs the basket. And she places her infant in this basket. And maybe she knows that a grown woman standing by a basket with a baby might be a little too suspicious. But nobody's going to think much of a child playing by the side of the river. So her older daughter, Miriam, Moses' sister, goes and takes watch over this basket as they place it on the bank by the river. The same Nile River that so many babies are being killed in. He is sat there alive and well. Pharaoh's daughter comes out to bathe and she sees the basket and she calls one of her maids to bring the basket to her. And she says, oh, this is a Hebrew child. This baby is crying and something stirs within her. Miriam, being just as courageous and bold as her mom, goes up to her and she says, would you like for me to go and get a Hebrew woman to nurse this baby? She says, yes. And of course, Miriam does what she should do. She goes and gets her mother to nurse her own son. And so, you're called, you're, you're, mm. <laughs> All right. Jacob 
dad is able to come and nurse her own biological son and get paid for it. Mm. Now, scripture implies that it wasn't that just that she was feeding her baby, right, while this baby was growing, but scripture implies that she was actually able to raise him until he was weaned from her breast. Mm. Now, ages zero to three are the most formative years of a baby's life. So this biological mother, by giving him love, was able to actually raise him and feed him and speak over him during the most formative years of his life until it was time to give him back. Pharaoh's daughter raised him as her own son. And she named him Moses because she had pulled him out of the river. I think it's very ironic that a river that had become so synonymous with the death of an entire people became transformed by one mother's faith into the very passageway that delivered her people from slavery and brought them to freedom. Now I realize that today is not an easy day for everyone. Pastor Mike has prayed and has rightfully acknowledged that so many women um, in our midst, either never had a mother who properly cared for them or was able to do what she, she needed to do, or they lost a mother, or they have a broken relationship with their mother. But there are also women in this community, um, myself among them, who have lost children. There are women in this community who have had a desire to conceive but haven't been able to. And so there's a lot of pain that sometimes is associated with Mother's Day. And I want to pause to acknowledge that, but while I am acknowledging that, I also want us to look at this passage, and I want us to look at this mother who faces a very harsh and painful reality in her motherhood. And what she does, the decisions that she makes, the lessons that she teaches us could possibly put us on a path towards healing. I believe that raising a child, even if you make all the proper and right decisions, whether you're a mother or a father, is risky business. It feels risky. Right? It feels scary. But I think um, Yekoabed really teaches us some things today, and I just want to look at those lessons real briefly. The first lesson I feel like she teaches us is she teaches us how to let go. She teaches us how to let go. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, letting go usually brings up some very mixed feelings within us. And the reason it does is because the implication of letting go means that we're holding on to something that we really, really want or desire or love, and it's doing something that we feel like we need, right? So the prospect or the fear of letting go means also letting go whatever that thing or that person does for us. I can recall a mother um, recounting her story of, of a daughter who was in a very toxic marriage, and she had a young child, and she had been talking to her daughter back and forth, back and forth, just wanting her to make healthy decisions for her and for her child, and, you know, she didn't want to press her to leave her husband because she felt like that wasn't her place. However, she just felt like she just was, was consumed with the guilt of whether or not she had made right choices as a mother, or whether or not she had led her in the right way. She was praying day in and day out. She was up at night, and one day her sons came to visit her, and the phone rang. And it was her daughter's neighbor calling to tell her that her daughter and her daughter's husband were engaged in a really bad argument because she could hear it across the yard. And so her sons immediately got up and they go towards the door as they had evidently many times before and she stops them. And she says, look, you can go down there. She says, but I just want you to be a quiet presence. She says, you don't intercede unless they try to put their hands on her. And she said that moment for her was a letting go. So many times she had wanted them to intercede, or she had tried to intercede, or she had tried to stop arguments, but she realized that this was a decision that her daughter had to make for herself. Letting go can be a very difficult thing, because we have poured into a person, or we love a person, or even if it's a project or a job, something that we've given so much of ourselves to. That when it comes time to let it go, because holding on to it might actually mean that it will die. It becomes very scary. And the catch of all of this is this. When we let go of a person that we love, in this season, it doesn't mean that we completely cut ties, but when we let go in this moment, as many parents have to do at various stages in their child's life, we are trusting God that whatever comes 
next is going to be better than what is now. Mm -hmm. It is an act of faith. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The beautiful part about, about what Jeboakan did was she, mm -hmm. at some point, he had to realize that this child belongs to God. Mm -hmm. yeah. She had to realize that if I hold on to him, he's going to die. And if I let him go, I can't protect him. She had to realize I am powerless yeah. in saving my son. She didn't realize she didn't have the ability or the capacity that if he was going to be saved, God was going to have to save him. Yeah. Yeah. That is a monumental moment in the life of a parent, whether you're a mother or you're a father. But it's also a monumental moment in the life of all of us who are, who are loving people, who are connected to people and things that we care so much about. We have to admit our limitation, admit that we are powerless. And in that moment, we are free to trust God and to let go. Now, letting go for her did not necessarily mean that she just stopped being a good mother. She did everything in her power to protect him. She put him in a waterproof basket. She made sure her daughter was there to do what she couldn't do. She did everything she could, but she knew that she still had to let him go. Why? Because if she held on to him, he would surely die. Some of us are in relationships. Some of us are engaged in things. Some of us have deeper levels of pain. Some of us are even connected or holding on to emotions, anger, undue guilt that is hindering us from having the ability to heal problems because we've lived so long with it that we don't know what it would look like not to have it anymore. Mm -hmm. It is stopping us from receiving what God has and from taking that next step. Either way you look at it, the ability to let go is an act of faith and it is an act of trusting God that God will provide something better than what is now. Yes. The second lesson yes. that we see that she teaches us is that we have to learn how to assume a different role. We have to learn how to assume a different role. Now, I'm sitting here and I'm looking to listen to Reverend, you know, um, Michael Ray Matthews up here and he talks about how he hasn't been in the pulpit for six years, right? I would love to pick his brain about what that transition looked like. Like, what does it look like to be in one position, right? And to know that it's time to transition to an entirely different position. She taught us that you have to learn how to assume a different role. Her rights say that she should have been able to raise her son. She should have been able to wipe his tears, to, to wipe every scrape, to make decisions about his discipline. But, but faith or the way things had worked out meant that she could no longer do that. Yeah. That decision was stripped from her. Yeah. Something had to shift. And everything about this passage gives us an indication that she actually embraced her new role in his life. So she could not be in the one that she wanted the first time. Yeah. Right? My grandmother, I felt like, was a very wise woman. She was very resilient. And she was very perceptive about change. Right? She was a church mother for many years in our church, and she was the secretary. And as things progressed, she realized that she was no longer the best person to do the things in the church that she was doing. You know, computers were coming on board, and you know, so many other people were coming up. And she says, okay, in order for this to progress and move in the right direction, I need to step back and assume a different role and let someone else take over here. So she put in her resignation, people begged her to stay, but she had enough wisdom and enough strength to say no. My time for this is past, right? I need to move to something else. Now, I'm willing to help whoever moves into this role, and maybe that's what I need to do, but this is gone. It's time for this to go. I need to take another role. I often wonder, what would the civil rights movement look like today if those who were fighting, those leaders in the 60s and the 70s, if in the 80s had said, we know it's time for us to shift in our role and pour it to somebody else? What would it look like? What would hip hop that has this massive influence in this world and rap and this massive influence in this world if the executives of Motown had embraced these new young brothers and said, mm, it's time to embrace something new. We need to assume a world of mentoring doing something different. Mm -hmm. Last night, my husband had on all the basketball stuff and I was watching, you know, all the stuff surrounding Mark Jackson being fired from the Warriors. And it, and it kind of struck me as I was preparing, continuing to prepare for this sermon, that you know this brother is being thrust into a different role beyond his 
his ability, right? He didn't make the choice to leave his job, right? So he finds himself in a new role, and one of the spokespersons for the Warriors said, well, you know, Mark Jackson was the right person for the job in 2011, but right now we need someone with different skills, a different set of skills in order to take us to the next level. Now, whether that's true or not, because I don't know anything about it, Dedrick says he was a great coach. <laughs> you know, I don't know anything about it. Whether that's true or not, I, I wonder what Mark Jackson is doing in order to embrace and assume a different role, because whether he likes it or not, it's staring him right in the face. There are times where we have to transition. We have to shift into a different role in the lives of the people that we love or in the position that we are in in this world. And how we embrace them, how we look at them, will make all the difference in the world. But it's necessary for us to assume a different world, a role when it's time because that may be the best opportunity someone else that we love has for moving in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Moses' mom assumed a different role, and I do believe she embraced it. What would have happened if she had said, no, I'm too hurt, I can't, I can't go and nurse him and sit him every day and then give him back? What if she had nursed him and then said, oh my gosh, I can't give him back and ran with him? Right? But here's a woman who was able to hold herself, was able to feed him. A lot of psychological and emotional attachment comes with feeding your child. She prayed over him. I can just see him praying and speaking history into him. And the scripture tells us that he knew he was a Hebrew. There was never a time in which Moses thought he was Egyptian. He knew he was a Hebrew. Now, he probably had some identity issues at some point, right? But that he had some level of attachment to who he was, to his people, and to his God. And I can't help but believe that was because his mom assumed a different role and embraced it and did everything she could to fill it out to its highest. Yeah. Sometimes we have to learn how to pursue a different role. Yeah. The last lesson I feel like she teaches us is that she teaches us that we need to allow others in our life to influence our children or the people and the things that we love. She allowed other women to be a mother to her child. There are many mother figures that are surrounding Moses. It began first, in terms of when I say mother, one who brings forth, who um, protects life, right? Who gives life. The first were these midwives, right? Who had the ability to end his life and say, no, we're not going to do that. They were following something, right? Something that God had placed within them um, to protect and nurture those who are living, right? To protect, not, not heal. Then we see Miriam, who is a young girl, right? Protecting her brother, watching out for him, standing in the gap when her mother cannot. And then we see Pharaoh's daughter, the woman who actually raises him, a woman who defies her father's rule, right, in order to love a Hebrew slave child. There is something deeper and greater going on here. I can remember my aunt Pauline, she was my great aunt. She went to, she went to church with us every Sunday. And my great aunt was very quiet, you know, she didn't really say much, you know. And so, you know, me and my cousin, we thought we were going to have a good time in church one day because we said, we're going to sit beside our Pauline and not my mom, right? <laughs> so we sat beside our Pauline and we just laughing and we giggling and we talking and we passing those back and forth. And next thing I know, I feel a tap on my arm. And I look and my Pauline is staring me dead in the face. She's not laughing, she's not smiling, right? She didn't lift her voice very high. She said, you got one more time. <laughs> to talk out or to laugh out in this service. And I'm not going to say another word. We're just going to get up and we're going to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm screaming in my head, what? Like, it's not like, Pauline. Like, you don't ever talk. Like, what gives you the right to call me out like that, right? And now I realize that my mom and my dad had given her that right. Right? They had, had extended a level of authority to people that they trust in their life to have influence over to me and to speak into my life. Right? Being a mother does not mean that you have ne necessarily physically bore a child. Miriam had not bore a child. Right? There's no indication that Pharaoh's daughter had bore a child. She may have. But this, this thing that's in you and in us and in them is there because God has placed it there. What does it mean to allow others to pour into you? I can remember countless numbers of times where people corrected me 
right? Where women corrected me, or nurtured me, and stood in a gap when my mom could not. That's what mothers do. Yes. But what would it have meant? Like, it took a lot of humility Amen. for you, COVID, to be able to do that. For her to overcome the thoughts in her mind that she is less than because she can't do every single thing for her child. Right? Feelings of worthlessness because she had to let him go. She had to have humility to watch other women care for her child in a way that she could not. Right. It takes humility. I was telling out at your service, I said, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I said, it took a lot of humility for me because some of the women who gave me the most encouragement were teen mothers. Mm. When it came to the birthing process, all these mature moms were like, oh, you need a girl, like, woo, girl, bang, right? Just all these hard stories. But to be able to listen to these teen mothers, right, who I am like 10, 12 years their senior, right? And they are pouring into me because they have had an experience that I have not. It humbled me, but I was so glad for it because it brought a balance and a positive experience to my birthing process, my daughter's birthing process, that I would not have had had I only had those negative voices in my head. Yeah. But it's not just us allowing influence of others in our, in our children's lives, right? Because I know we don't want everybody to influence their life, but we should not allow those few to overcome those who can, right? But it's also us. We need that influence. Yeah. The question becomes, how do I know when it's time to let go? How do I know I'm not letting go too soon? You have to have a body of people around you who can help you see what you are too blind to see by your love and your life. You need other mothers around you, even other fathers around you, other people of wisdom who can say, I love you, but baby, you got to let that go. Yes. No, hold on a little while longer. Wait a minute, right? You don't have to do this kind of stuff in isolation, but it takes humility so to be able to live your life in such a way. And that's what makes the best mothers. That's what makes the best fathers. That's what makes the best people. To be able to be in a place of humility where you allow the influence of wise and loving people in your life because God has placed them there for a purpose. And COVID let go. She assumed a different role. She accepted the influence of others in her son's life. And he grew up to deliver a nation. Yeah. That's a powerful purpose. Right there. So I don't know what you're dealing with today as you stand to your feet. I don't know what your thoughts are in your mind, and I don't know what you're feeling in your heart and in your spirit. But I want us to take a moment as we be in this space often to just close our eyes and to be honest with God. Some of us may not be feeling anything, that's okay. You're present with God, feeling nothing. Some of us are feeling apprehension. Some of us are feeling confusion about what we've heard and some of the situations that we're dealing with. Some of us are still dealing with pain. Some of us are ecstatic and joyful. Whatever you're feeling, I'm just pressing you to be honest with God right now in this moment and just be present with it. Wherever you are, wherever you are, just be there. Accept it. And open your heart to God enough to say, God, even if I don't know if I can trust you, I want to trust you. I desire to trust you. I desire, Lord, to let go of some things that maybe already died and is holding me back because I just can't let it go. God, I know it's time for me to move into a different role of someone in my life or a different role on my job or a different role in my community but God is scary and I don't know if I can do it on my own so I was saying I want to trust you with that God. God I often get defensive when people try to speak into my life or try to help me or try to make suggestions God because I think it makes me feel like I don't know what I'm doing God and I don't want to be that way God I just want to be able to receive and to get all the wisdom you're giving to me. If that's where you are, just be present with God. God, I just want to trust you. God, first we acknowledge you as 
the creator of all existence. God, you created each of us in your image, God, and you molded us and you knew us before we were even formed in the womb of our mother's belly. God, you know our thoughts before we think them. You know our words before we speak them. God, you know the genetic makeup of every tree, of every blade of grass, God, of every flower, God, of every molecule of dirt, Almighty God, of every cloud in the sky, God. You know all of your creation in and out, God, because you are the first to create. God, you have a power that is beyond our ability to comprehend, God. You have an ability to do things, God, that we could never do, God. You have the power to heal and to save and to deliver and to provide, God. You have the ability, God, to give us hope where we are in despair, God. You have the ability to bring forth stuff out of nothing. And so, God, we want to first acknowledge you as a God who sees everything and who knows everything and has power over everything. God, we do not always give you the proper respect for that position. And so, God, in every place that we find ourselves this morning, every situation that may be on our mind or on our heart, God, every time that we pray for somebody, God, for that prayer, God, that we have just been tired of praying, God, for that place, Almighty God, where we are just so lonely and so tired of it, God, for that moment, God, where we're tired of arguing, God, God, for that place, God, where we're tired of pitching pennies, God, and trying to figure out what is our purpose, God, for those moments in our life right now where we are tired. God, we pray right now that you touch it and you change it and you shift it. But more than anything, God, Lord, shift the doubt in our hearts, God. Shift the, the faithlessness in our spirit, God. Lord, just rejuvenate us, God, and let us see you for who you are, God. May we turn our eyes to you, God, and see what we have not been able to see before, God. Where there is pain, God, cut through it like a sword, Almighty God, so that we may be open to the warmth of your light, God, so that our hearts will not be hardened. God, I pray for the mothers in this place who have lost their children. God, I pray for the daughters and the sons in this place who have lost their mothers, Almighty God. Lord, I pray for the women in this place, God, who have so many regrets in their life, Almighty God, and I pray for freedom oh, yeah. and deliverance in this place in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you are able to allow us to see, God, that you have called us to something greater. You have placed your hand on us, God, and you are offering your anointing to us, Almighty God, to be the men and women who are protectors of life, Lord, that we will speak life, God, and not death, Almighty God, that we will walk by people, God, who we see are struggling, God, and we will pray, or we will lay a hand, or we will smile, or we will engage in a conversation, trusting, God, that we don't save anybody, God, but that through the conduits of love that you have placed within us, Almighty God, that you can do something great in that person's life. God, open our eyes to see as you see in our hearts, to grieve for the things that you grieve for, God. And then give us the power that we need, even in our limitation, God, to say yes to you. To say yes to trusting you. Yes, God. To say yes to depending wholeheartedly on you. God, remove from us the need to always see the next step. Knowing, God, that if we walk by faith, God, that you will be there every step of the way, putting the next plank on the bridge before us. God, we thank you that you have been faithful beyond measure. Yes. And God, we pray that you break through anything that we are thinking or feeling or experiencing, God. Lord, that as we struggle with you and as we walk with you and as we pray with you, God, Lord, that you will commune with us. Yes, Lord that you will shift stuff in us, that you will move us to another plane. God, that we may be your people and that you might be pleased with us. Now, God, we turn once more to those in this world who are without the basic necessities that we often take for granted. God, we pray more specifically for the over 300 young women who have been snatched from their schools in Nigeria. God, I pray for the hearts of their mothers and their fathers, their aunties, their sisters and brothers today. God, I pray for those who find themselves in the hands of unfamiliar men, God. I pray, Lord Almighty God, that you touch their minds and their hearts and their spirits. And God, dare I say, I pray for justice, God. And Lord, if you are so moved to allow us to participate in the healing of our people in that way, God. Just open your mouth and speak, God, and we are ready to respond. We are saying, God, we want to be obedient to you. So, God, form on our lips this week, this month, this year, and the years to come prayers for them, God. Because even if they are returned home, God, there is much healing to 
be garnered. So God, give us a heart and a mind and a breath to pray. Yes, Lord. God, we thank you that you speak and we ask that you open our ears that we can hear. For God, participating in the healing of others brings healing to us. And so God, whatever our needs are, we are trusting by faith that if we let it go to you in this moment, that you are going to make it better than what it is right now. In the name of He who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.